Dr. Brenda Andrews. Apparently, apparently, we have a closer genetic relationship to the ubiquitous yeast spore than any of you may actually think. And um, I read, Dr. Andrews, that you are currently working with colleagues on a large collaborative project to build a yeast genetic interaction map. Yes. That's yes, right. I am. Perhaps you could tell us why. I'll tell you. <laughs> About a year ago, we established a new program in CIFAR called Genetic Networks. And I'm going to explain to you why the time was ripe to really start such a program and to exploit some of the major advances that have been made in genetics over the last 10 years. And what I hope to do is, by introducing you to this program, just to provoke your thoughts about what the practice of medicine might look like in 10 years because of some of the advances in biomedicine I'll describe, and what that might mean for your, your health and your life, and what kinds of things we need, as a society need to be thinking about because of these advances. We are at a crossroads in the biomedical sciences right now, and the reason we're at this crossroads is really because of uh, the Human Genome Project and other projects like it that most of you will have heard about. This particular project revealed the genetic code in all of our cells at a price tag of about $3 billion US. It was really completed by a consortium of US scientists. And we've had a view of this genome sequence, and I'll explain that to you as I go through uh, my talk, for a few years now. And so it's, it's time to sit back and say, so what? We were told that this $3 billion project would revolutionize the way that we treat medicine. We'd all have personalized medicine. We would no longer be poisoning people with cancer drugs. We'd figure it all out. And really, we haven't. We have yet to realize or reap the benefits of this very important project. I don't mean to say it's not important, but we have yet to reap the benefits of the project. And the reason is because we've discovered, of course, as is often the case in science, that it's a lot more complicated than we thought. And it's not about individual genes, it's about how all these genes interact to make us individuals, to make yeast yeast, and to make humans humans. Most scientists, especially biomedical scientists, use very simple model systems to try to understand biological processes. It's pretty difficult to do genetics on us, so we like to look at very simple systems that we can manipulate in the laboratory to try to understand things. And lucky for us, it turns out that pretty much, as Moses said, we have a lot more in common with yeast than you might like to think. And this particular video here is my favorite organism, budding yeast. This is the budding yeast that we use to make beer and wine and bread and whatnot. And it's just going through cell division. That's what it does. This is basically its life. But it's still a very beautiful process, at least I think it is. They just divide by putting out little buds, but they don't put them out randomly. They actually know where they budded before, and it's a very intricate process. And it turns out what makes the, the yeast cells do that is the same thing that makes this little embryo that I'm going to show you dividing on the right do, do the same thing. So this is just a little video movie. It's beautiful of a Drosophila embryo dividing. This is a fly maggot, you know, the things on your bananas. But people study this uh, because it's a very useful system in which to do genetics. And we're just seeing these, these embryonic cells divide. And what would happen is over the course of these cell divisions, it will turn from this mass of little cells that are sort of doing this dance of division into a fly. As the more we study this, the more we realize that it's the same. Basically, the molecules that make the budding yeast divide are the same as the molecules that make the fly embryos divide, and are the same as what makes the cells in our bodies divide. So really, we can learn an awful lot by studying these very simple systems, and that's been the driving force behind a lot of the genetic science has gone on over the past uh, many years. And so really, the, the rationale for these big genome projects is, well, if all the information is there, surely the heck, if we decode it, we'll understand everything. So that's sort of the whole basis of these human genome projects. If we can figure out what the, what the parts lists are for these organisms, we're going to be able to put together these beautiful pathways and figure out what makes cells divide and what makes them divide inappropriately, like in cancer. So in the last 20 years then, uh, there's been major developments in technology that allowed scientists to chemically determine the sequence of DNA. We've been treated to the a view of the genome sequence for a large number of organisms. Uh, first, we started off with little viruses and bacteria, and then people moved on as the technology developed and started sequencing bigger and bigger and bigger genomes. And finally, um, in 1998, the Human Genome Project was funded by the NIH, and we began to try to get a view of that. Of that. Our ability to produce the information uh, vastly exceeds our ability to understand it. So really, we really don't know what's going on, and I'll try to point that out. So here we are again with our dividing yeast cells and our dividing fly cells. And in 1996, so that's over 10 years ago now, uh, the genome sequence of the yeast was determined. And what we discovered when we looked at that was that uh, yeast has about 6,000 of these units of information or genes. 
So scientists figured, uh, well, that's great. That means that humans are going to have at least, how, how many would you think? 200,000, right? If you can make a yeast with uh, uh, 6,000 genes, surely to God we have 200,000 genes. It turns out we're wrong, dead wrong, that you can just sort of double the number of genes and you can get a fly. It's a lot more complicated. You can then double it again and you get a person. So it's now estimated that there's only about 25,000 to 30,000 genes in our genomes and all of the information is there to make us human. Most of the genes that we can look at are completely uncharacterized, despite the fact that there's been scientists and geneticists working on this for years. We really don't know that much about what, what they do or how to recognize them. And what we've discovered is that it's not just a single gene that determines a trait, uh, but usually it's how genes interact that determine the trait. So that's the complexity that, that I was talking about. If we can understand how they interact to make a normal cell, then we're going to be able to understand how they interact to make a diseased cell. Yeast geneticists have been working on this for a long time, so these are really big collaborative projects involving labs from all over the world. They got together and they looked at the parts list of 6,000 genes in yeast and said, well, we're geneticists. Um, if we remove gene A and we ask what happens to the yeast, we'll figure out what gene A does. Break it, ask what goes wrong, figure out what the gene does. That's sort of what geneticists do. So we figured now we've got all 6,000, let's just systematically remove them and make a whole collection of yeast where we can look at what, what, ha what goes wrong when we remove each of the genes. And so we have these collections now, we call them arrays of yeast strains in which there's yeast strains on these plates where each one of these little yeast uh, colonies, we call them, is missing a particular gene. And then we can just go in there and say, what's wrong? And it turns out that of these 6,000 genes, you can delete any one of 5,000 of them. So that's most of them and not a lot goes wrong. So really that's kind of was sort of shocking to us, right? We thought that we were going to be able to figure it all out just by looking at this. And again, we're wrong. And it's again getting back to that complexity. Moving one gene is not enough because thankfully the cell is pretty good at buffering itself from these perturbations. We'd all be in trouble if, if our cells couldn't cope with these kind of perturbations. So again, this is a big motivation for us to go in there and start hammering away at these yeast cells. Instead of just having a yeast colony lacking one gene, let's make it lacking two or three. Let's combine everything together and see how they interact and look for something to go wrong. And that's the, one of the big projects we've undertaken, and that's this genetic interaction map that was mentioned uh, in the introductory remarks. That's many, many millions of experiments to do to try to figure out what's going on. So to, uh, to really address this, we had to start working with uh, robotics engineers. We wanted to have robots that could manipulate these yeast arrays very efficiently so that we could do these big projects. We actually then feed these yeast arrays into these robots and manipulate them and start making double mutants and multiple mutants and ask what goes wrong. Here's the pin head coming down, and what it's doing is it's going on to the uh, array of yeast, and these floating pin heads are just sort of sitting down. Their yeast are very sticky. It's picking them up and then it just goes over and it prints it onto another plate. And all of these plates just allow us to check for different genetic problems. So we're just basically able to take all these arrays and within a couple of weeks, look at all of the yeast genes in a bunch of different conditions. There were a lot more interactions than we expected. And so we think these types of genetic interactions will underlie pretty much all of the complex traits that determine uh, 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 human uh, genetics, and it's very hard to study in humans, although scientists are starting to figure out ways to build these types of maps in more complex systems. We're continuing this work in yeast, though, because we hope it will be a template for understanding these more complex systems as we move along. To do this type of research, we have to make people interact that normally don't talk to each other very much. We have to have human geneticists, computational biologists, network theorists, statisticians, they all have to be together in the same place. And we really, it's, it, you think that sounds trivial, but actually scientists traditionally work in, you know, very, in their own labs, in their own little worlds, and talk just to each other. But really, it, this kind of science demands a complete breakdown of those kinds of ideas. And so that's why we built this new institute at U of T to allow these kinds of interactions to take place. And I must say, it's, it's really working very well, and it's quite exciting. What could happen then? I've been telling you how complicated it is, how we have all this information. Where is it going to go? Well, now that we're getting our acts together, I think we really will have uh, some big changes in how we treat complex diseases in the next 10 years. And one very simple example is here. We all know how cancer is treated now. Basically, we just hit people with drugs that stop cells from dividing, but that means it stops cells from dividing all over your body. Now, supposing that this woman learns she has cancer in 2025, we can use these various techniques like DNA chips and other kinds of functional genomic tools I haven't had time to talk to you about to discover what genes are causing her particular cancer. 
It's not going to be the one causing your cancer. And supposing the doctors find out she's got five mutant genes that are producing this tumor, and then they can go back and look up and find a combination of drug treatments that seem to work very well when those genes are, are not working properly. So her cancer is controlled, and she'll have low side effects from these drug treatments. Uh, what are the ethical issues involved? The science is moving along very quickly, and as a society, we haven't really uh, come to grips with that, I don't think. One example, for example, it's going to be very rare that uh, you're going to be able to look at your genome sequence and go, absolutely, for sure, this is going to happen to you. It's going to be all probabilities. So supposing that a pregnant woman has a test and the doctor says, well, on the basis of the genetic information we sequence a genome, uh, there's a 50% chance higher than average that the baby will develop cardiovascular disease by the time it's 50. Is that useful? Uh, what would we do with that information? What's acceptable? What's, what's an acceptable higher than average probability of developing some sort of uh, complex disease? So these are all things I think we have to think about pretty quickly because this is coming down the pipe. You can actually sign up now to get your genome sequenced uh, for about $1,000 in certain labs that are developing these kinds of technologies. So I hope that's given you some food for thought about where the Human Genome Project might be going.